right, it looks like we are we are a go. Is that right, Jamie? Yep, I just got a notification on my phone. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We're really glad uh, to be with you this evening. My name is Rabbi Daniel Berg. I'm the Rabbi of Beth Am Synagogue in Reservoir Hill in central West Baltimore. Uh, and I'm uh, going to be joined in just a little bit by Congressman Kwaisi Mfume. Uh, for now, I have uh, his district director, Anthony Jones, here with me. And while we're awaiting the congressman uh, who uh, was pulled away this evening for a, a, a family event, uh, that he didn't, uh, he wasn't aware of until until recently. Um, he'll be joining us by 7:15 today. But Mr. Jones is here uh, to be to kick things off with me, and we're really glad that you could be here with us as well, everybody. Um, Anthony, maybe I can just ask you a little bit about our district. I know. Uh, you have a lot of familiarity with Baltimore politics. You've served in a number of different capacities. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about the 7th Maryland Congressional District, if you would. No, absolutely. And Rabbi Burke, thank you for uh, having us and myself in the interim. I know that the congressman will be joining us shortly, and he's excited to be a part of this conversation and this, the series of conversations that you all and the partners um, are hosting. Um, but you know, as you said, I'm very familiar with Reservoir Hill Improvement Council, Beth Am Synagogue. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the neighborhood and have really enjoyed over the past couple of, you know, years to seeing the renaissance that is really emerging and has been taking place uh, in the neighborhood. Just this past, I think it was last week, we had the opportunity to participate in the St. Francis Center groundbreaking. And so, you know, it's been small steps like that, that we've been able to witness the transformation that's taking place uh, in Reservoir Hill. And, and you know, being where it's situated uh, in central, central Baltimore, uh, really, really, as you're traversing along North Avenue, you're getting an opportunity to see that growth and what it means for the city as it's growing all over the city. So I'm excited to be here and, and, and be a part of this conversation. Well, I appreciate that. And, and maybe you can also uh, give us a sense of the district itself. So where, yeah. where is it located? I, I know it's, uh, maybe you don't like to use the word gerrymandered, uh, <laughs> hard to avoid it when you look at this particular district. Uh, what areas does it actually include? I will say, you know, we have one of the more diverse districts uh, in the state. Uh, so the congressman represents the seventh congressional district, and that includes Baltimore City. Uh, but Baltimore City also is represented by Congressman Sarbanes and a portion by Congressman Ruppersberger as well. But the seventh includes Baltimore City, the vast majority of that made up of Baltimore County uh, to the north and Howard County to the west. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we we go pretty far. Uh, we go all the way, you know, you go all the way to Arnold. We've got Columbians. So we've got a real representation of what Maryland is uh, in the 7th Congressional District. Yeah, well, I hope you get mileage reimbursement because you, you <laughs> can be driving everywhere covering this district. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think luckily we're saved a little bit by uh, all of our virtual events that we get to participate in right now. But nonetheless, uh, you know, we, we've got a pretty big task of representing uh, each of the three jurisdictions that make up the seventh district. So, yeah. Sure. Now, Anthony, you used to live in Reservoir Hill, is that right? Well, t I was in the 1900 block of Linden uh -huh. uh, and, and, you know, I had an opportunity to be in Reservoir Hill for lots of the summer activities. And uh, I you know, was talking to someone earlier and we were just reminiscing about, I think it was a couple of years ago and the Kaboom Playground uh, sure. when that was being built. And so I've, I've, I've been around uh, quite a while, quite a while. Yeah, and so I, you know, that playground actually, uh, my wife, that was her baby. So when we came yep. Yep. To, uh, to Baltimore, uh, she and another neighbor named Ellis Brown kind of put their heads together and, uh, you know, came to the conclusion after talking to people that it would be really nice to have a clean, safe play space in the neighborhood. And, and uh, Miriam was able to 
leverage some uh, some some initial seed money to to get that and get the Ravens involved. And together with Beth Am and other community partners, we were able to put that up uh, in that barn raising style that Kaboom does. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it was, and you know, it really was an alternative space to a lot of the programming that was taking place uh, at the school. And you had Miss Cookie down there, yes. uh, who, who was just a, a huge asset uh, to this community and, and really went above and beyond what, what you know, so many folks would do as a Park and Rec's leader. Uh, but it, it was a nice compliment uh, in programming, and it was a great opportunity to have so many of the community partners and stakeholders out there. I remember then it was then Mayor Rawlings Blake and Dick Cass, and you just had a great collection of folks out there to make that happen. So yes, it was that was a lot of fun. We miss Miss Cookie around here uh, a yeah. lot. Um, I, I would love to, uh, you know, I know for those who are just tuning in, Congressman Mfume is on his way. He was delayed slightly due to a family obligation uh, this evening. He is to join us in a, just about five minutes uh, at 7.15. Um, but I'm speaking now with Anthony Jones, who is the Congressman's uh, District Director. And Anthony, maybe uh, maybe I could also ask you, since you have some familiarity with the neighborhood and and while uh, the congressman, this has been his district before. The district has changed a little bit uh, since the first go around. Um, what sort of advice do you think you'll have for, for the congressman <laughs> in terms of representing th this community in particular of Reservoir Hill? And what kinds of things do you want to make sure that he knows about our community, our priorities and values and concerns? Well, I, I don't know if there's much advice that I can give him. <laughs> <laughs> but what I will say is, you know, one of the things that the congressman is committed to is making sure that that this office, his office and the people's office of the 7th Congressional District really reflects the voice of the people that it represents. Uh, and with that being said, you know, the congressman has made it very clear his expectation about providing great constituent service. So I would say to anyone uh, you know, if they are experiencing an issue uh, that they feel that they might reach out to the congressional office on, we are here. Uh, obviously, we're all working virtually for the most part, uh, but, you know, you can reach out to the congressman at Enfume. Uh, that's M-F-U-M-E, period, house, period, gov. And, you know, while we are working through all of that, that's what I would say is the advice that we give to the congressman. Our job is to really make sure that we are the eyes and ears of the, of the congressman here in the district as a district director, uh, and that we are conveying uh, and communicating the priorities that we are seeing out on the ground uh, to the congressman. So that way we're having a really informed conversation uh, with what's taking place from the policymaking standpoint. So that, that's how I would answer that. Uh, not much advice, but we are at the service of the people of the 7th Congressional District uh, in all ways that we can be. Well, I appreciate your humility, but I, I hope he does take your advice. You know, I certainly would would want our congressman to be, uh, you know, uh, both both, uh, you know, able to give orders to and take advice from uh, uh, from those he brings into the fold. And I know, look, a, a U.S. congressman can only be in so many places at once, right? And so, relying on quality uh, staff who are uh, helping to prepare him for legislation, prepare him for constituent concerns, uh, I think is is really the the sign of uh, of an effective U.S. representative. So uh, I'm sure that there's a collaborative relationship. In Absolutely. The I know that his predecessor, Congressman Cummings uh, uh, of blessed memory, uh, certainly relied on his staff as well. Absolutely. And, and we've got a fantastic district team. Uh, you know, I'm just one of seven other individuals who make up that team. And, you know, we've got Whatever the constituent issues range from, whether it be transportation, uh, I, I will say that we know that unemployment still remains a very important issue. And with respect to that, uh, Rabbi, is you know one of the things that we make an important point is that we make sure that we're beyond just some of the congressional issues that many of our constituents feel. Uh, we recognize, and he recognized more importantly, the, the strain that thousands of families in the 7th Congressional District are experiencing right now. And so that's a very important aspect when we talk about 
uh, the relationship and, and the communication that takes place in our office internally. Sure. Well, uh, uh, have you gotten word from the congressman? Is he still on target to be with us in a couple he minutes? Be on time. Yep, he should be on with us right now or shortly. Uh, I am just checking right now. So if you see my eyes peering off to the side, uh, I'm sure he is logging into uh, our Zoom link uh, shortly. So, yeah. Under Understood. Um, well, maybe. Uh, and I know we are working to have a very substantive conversation. Uh, and so we'll make sure that that, that that gets an opportunity to take place. And so I apologize to, to our viewers tonight who are tuning in, uh, you know, joining us. Yeah, we, we understand, uh, you know, balancing uh, life, uh, you know, and work is, is always a challenging thing. And uh, to be there for uh, an important family event is, 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 uh, uh, also a value. Well, maybe I'll maybe I will begin to introduce the congressman, um, if that's okay. And as he joins us, um, if uh, he'll he'll kind of yeah, I think uh, we'll be able to see him once he logs in. Okay. Wonderful. Well, so I'll, I'll begin, folks. Uh, once again, the the the, uh, the delay is Congressman and Fume has a, a, a family. I, I understand a happy family event um, that conflicted a little bit with our time together, which is why he is uh, just a little bit delayed. But we're delighted to welcome Congressman uh, Kwaisi Mfume, the uh, U.S. Representative of the Seventh District of Maryland, to be joining us this evening. Uh, Mr. Mfume is uh, uh, was born, raised, and educated uh, here in the city of Baltimore. He attended Morgan State University uh, uh, here in Baltimore as well, where as an honor student, he graduated magnum cum laude, and he later returned as an adjunct professor to Morgan State. Uh, he served uh, from 1986 to 1996 as the uh, U.S. representative from this district as well, and then left uh, his seat of, uh, in order to become the president and CEO of the NAACP. So that was in 1996. Uh, he was elected again to Congress following the loss of our beloved and celebrated Congressman Elijah Cummings, a good friend of Kwaisi's, I know. Uh, and he was recently elected to the uh, full term in the 117th Congress upcoming. Um, so that is Congressman Umfume, and how are we doing? Are, is he with us just yet? I think Jamie is checking now, so right. I apologize. Uh, we're, we're checking right now. Okay. Folks are just tuning in. We're a little delayed. Uh, with our start, but uh, unlike in-person events where we can uh, we can sort of pass around donuts, uh, we uh, we didn't want to start late when we found out that we were going to be a little delayed. Just so you knew that we would be here. So hang with us. Feel free to go ahead and get a donut yourself, and uh, take two for that matter. I mean, it's your calories, not mine. <laughs> and uh, and we should be beginning with the congressman momentarily. Very shortly. I apologize uh, to our viewers. I think while we're waiting, uh, maybe I'll just take a moment to talk a little bit about uh, Beth Am Synagogue and uh, some of its partners who are bringing this series to you. Um, the, the series is called Newly Elected and So Much to Do. And uh, we had this idea that with uh, four individuals who were going to be representing our neighborhood here in Reservoir Hill uh, in a new capacity, that it might be a good uh, opportunity to engage each of those individuals in conversations about some of the things that matter to us here in Reservoir Hill and uh, might also matter to our congregation, congregational communities, faith communities, the Jewish community uh, uh, as a whole as well. Um, so um, uh, in speaking about and thinking about this particular uh, event, uh, we uh, had incoming Mayor Brandon Scott uh, just a 
couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. That was a great conversation. Uh, he has a lot of wonderful ideas for Baltimore City, uh, and it seems like he is ready and rearing to go. I know that the inauguration is tomorrow, and there's a lot of excitement about him beginning. Uh, we also, in addition to Congressman Mfume, will be uh, visited by uh, incoming uh, city councilman James Torrance, uh, who will be visiting with us at the beginning of January, January 7th. And I'm waiting for confirmation on the specific date for council president-elect Nick Mosby, but he will be joining us likely toward the end uh, of January as well. Uh, in terms of our partners this evening, uh, uh, Beth Am Synagogue, as I mentioned, also has a sister nonprofit organization called IFO, In For Of The Neighborhood. Uh, and we're working this evening with the Reservoir Hill Improvement Council, RHIC, the Upper Utah Madison Neighborhood Association, the St. Francis Neighborhood Center, uh, and also the Men of the Hill, which is a newer organization. I don't think it was around when you lived in the area, Anthony, but uh, it's a great it group. Wasn't, of, it wasn't, it wasn't, but I've, yeah. I've been trying to do some more research on it. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good group. I think we try to keep things, you know, a little bit um, um, sort of uh, off the radar. There's no like official website or anything like that. It's really just a group of guys who are coming together for fellowship and volunteerism, mentorship in the neighborhood as well. Um, you, you, uh, if you, do you want to call them and just check in? Make I'm gonna, sure everything's all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That would be just fine. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. If you're just tuning in, uh, we are waiting on Congressman Mfume, who was a little delayed this evening. Hopefully he will be, uh, along shortly. I do want to say to folks that if you're tuning in on YouTube right now, you can place your questions in the chat. I believe some of those have already started to come in, uh, and that is the best way for us to convey some of your questions to the congressman uh, when he gets here. I'll start out with a few questions of my own, and then we'll open it up to some questions that we will try to curate from the chat. Uh, the congressman was a little delayed this evening, but we're looking forward to having him here any moment now. I see there's already a couple of questions that have come in from the chat, uh, a question about the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which I will be happy to ask the Congressman when we get to that portion, and also a question uh, about the agenda with respect to Reservoir Hill specifically, which definitely I want to be asking him uh, about. It's a large district and uh, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and one of the things that we want to make sure is that uh, in addition to meeting the needs uh, of this broader and very diverse district, that the congressman has his attention on Reservoir Hill and Central West Baltimore as well. That's why we're doing this program this evening. So thank you for your patience, everybody. Let's hope he arrives momentarily. While we're waiting, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about the room in which I'm sitting right now. This is not a virtual background. This is my actual background. It's our sanctuary here at Beth Am Synagogue. It, it's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, you'll notice we have some plexiglass up there on the Bema so we can separate the different sides of the Bema during our services these days. Uh, we have not been meeting in person. We've been doing virtual services and there's a camera in the room, uh, but we have had a small group of people just to kind of make the service happen. And in fact, this coming Friday night, we'll have services uh, celebrating uh, my 
10 years here at Beth Am with a musical service in the evening at 6.30 called Clay Kodesh and uh, on Shabbat morning, Saturday morning as well for our services. And then Sunday morning, we'll have uh, a talk from Rabbi Elliot Dorf, uh, who's a well-known scholar, uh, internationally known scholar, um, who will be speaking about uh, collective responsibility and collective forgiveness. He'll be doing that on Sunday morning, uh, an important topic these days when we think about um, the, the number of things there are to forgive and how do we get to places where we are sitting less in judgment of our neighbors and trying to find some common ground, even as we are addressing real questions of injustice and uh, systemic oppression. Uh, so I'm sure that'll be a great teaching from Rabbi Dorf. Um, this room uh, and this building is nearly 100 years old. Betham was built in 1922 uh, by Chizik Amuna Congregation, who was here until the uh, 70s. And by 1974, Chizik Amuna had already built their campus on Stevenson Road in the county, and they were ready to sell the building. A number of in-town historic synagogues were sold to uh, churches and uh, other institutions. Um, there was an interest uh, among Chizik Amuna's part for this to remain a synagogue. And luckily there was an interest among a number of folks who had come to the in-town Chizik Amuna here in what's now called Reservoir Hill. It was not called Reservoir Hill in those days in maintaining this building as a synagogue uh, in, in the city. And so in 1974, a group of congregants got together and uh, under the leadership of Dr. Lou Kaplan, purchased the building from Chizik Amuna and created Beth Am Synagogue. So we are a 46, 47 year old-ish congregation in a nearly 100 year old building. We'll be celebrating the centennial of this historic building uh, coming up in, in just a couple of years, about a year and change in uh, 2022. So I'm sure there'll be opportunities to celebrate this historic building at that time. We also just finished a, re a renovation, a multi-million dollar renovation of our building. And I see that Congressman Umfume has joined us. Good to see you, Congressman. Thank you. Good to be here. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you had a uh, you have a family uh, event tonight as well that was unforeseen. So I we hope that was a joyous one, and we're glad that you're also able to join us here. Well, thank you very much. I just <clears throat> literally got out of the car 15 minutes ago um, from Washington. We're voting uh, all this week trying to pass an omnibus spending bill as well as a COVID relief package. So I'm a little out of breath from uh, running in the house, but I'm very glad to be here. Glad to be here also with all of the partners who work with you to help make this possible. Well, thank you. And I'll mention those partners once again, just so that you know uh, who they are, not only Beth Am Synagogue here in Reservoir Hill, but also our sister nonprofit, IFO, In For Of The Neighborhood, which serves to uh, engage with our neighbors, black, white, and brown, and to work collaboratively toward increasing relationships and softening boundaries of race and class and religion. Uh, we also have the uh, Upper Utah Madison Neighborhood Association, the Reservoir Hill Improvement Council, the St. Francis Neighborhood Center and a new group called Men of the Hill, which is a very cool group of guys who have been getting together doing mentoring and uh, volunteerism in the neighborhood and also just enjoying one another sometimes in the backyard with a socially distanced beer or uh, a little bit of fellowship. Um, I took the liberty, uh, I hope it's okay, Congressman, of introducing you before you arrived, um, just to, so that we could have more time to get to the substance of our conversation together. Um, and since you already know who you are, now everybody else knows who you are if they didn't already. And I wanna thank you for making the time to be with us today. I also wanna remind folks who are tuning in that you can place your questions into the YouTube chat, and I will do my best uh, at the conclusion of my, uh, my uh, questions for the congressman to convey uh, at least a number of those questions to him here uh, this evening. So Congressman Umfume, while you're catching your breath, I'll just say a word of introduction. Last January, uh, which was before COVID, it feels like a another world. Um, but uh, you heard me preach on Martin Luther King weekend at Union Baptist 
church uh, uh, with uh, our our good friend, Reverend Al Hathaway. And uh, um, uh, I'm not going to ask you to recite that sermon now. Um, I'm sure you were paying attention. I'm not sure I remember my own sermons uh, the next week, let alone months later. But I will uh, I will say that that day in honoring the legacy of Dr. King, I spoke about the danger of incuriosity. And uh, it's been my sense that one of the real challenges and opportunities of Baltimore, frankly, uh, and also America right now, is how few people seem to express genuine curiosity for one another. Uh, curiosity about science, good curiosity about what makes good government, about differing faith traditions and worldviews. Uh, you're speaking right now to a synagogue community in an historic Jewish majority black neighborhood, a coalition of organizations who have come together to engage our newly elected officials in conversation. So let me begin with this, Congressman. What do you think those joining us today should be curious about? What should we be paying attention to here in Baltimore, in America, as you begin uh, your next term as our Congressman? Well, I think that on a macro level, we have to pay close attention to the fragility of our democracy. We tend to take it for granted. We believe that since 1776, that the United States, after having gone through all sorts of problems, some of which were quite ugly, like the peculiar institution of American slavery, uh, through several world wars and through a period recently in the last 20, 30 years where we are learning, at least trying to learn to be more tolerant, we kind of assume that our democracy is gonna take care of itself, that it will be there and that all the things that are enshrined in the constitution uh, and in its preamble will protect us. And of course, everybody will uh, pay attention to it and no one will get out of line. We take for granted uh, our system of voting within our democracy. Uh, and we assume that everybody can vote who wants to vote, and that we assume also there are not efforts to suppress that vote. We think um, sometimes, and in my opinion, in terms that might be a little too glorious about those of us who serve in the Congress of the United States or the Senate, uh, and for that matter, the White House, when the real, real power of this country has always come from the bottom up, not from the top down. It's from people of all races, religions, backgrounds, regions across this country that when they focus on protecting uh, the democracy and when they focus on agility of that democracy, that we are better off. I raise that because of what has happened here with this last election on November 3rd mm. and the attempts of the current president to undermine the will of the people, the expressed will, which has been confirmed confirmed again and reconfirmed by judges, by courts, uh, and by the simple math that we've all had a chance to look at and perhaps have come, become a little too bored looking at over the last weeks or so. But this situation is not just um, interesting, it is extremely unique. And it says to us that we could preserve our democracy if we always pay attention to it and not assume that it will preserve itself. Mm -hmm. On a um, micro level here in Baltimore, I think we ought to be paying attention to what happens after tomorrow with the swearing in of Mayor Scott and what happens the day after tomorrow after swearing in of the controller and the city council. What kind of direction are we going to take? Is there a blueprint? Uh, aside from all the nice things that we tend to say when we're running for office, what is the plan? Uh, how do neighborhoods get empowered? How do we find a way to break down barriers to get businesses interested in Baltimore? But more importantly, how do we start businesses, particularly micro business enterprises in a lot of our communities that desperately want a circular flow of capital? Uh, the violence that has beset us far too long is still with us. Doesn't go anywhere just because administrations change. It goes away because administrations change and then the administration coming in makes a real and lasting difference. Sometimes I'm just blown away by the notion of 300 people being killed 
in our streets every year for six straight years. And then with the exception of a few years before that, that was the case in the 90s also. Uh, that kind of violence is a threat to all of us. I think about people who don't have mobility, who are poor, who are in communities, who are elderly, who can't get around, who are trapped in many respects in their neighborhoods. And yet I can't help to remember what neighborhoods used to be like when there was a real effort for beautification through things like the Afro Clean Block campaign, mm -hmm. efforts toward reducing violence like the real officer friendly campaign and people like Sergeant the late Dickie Burke and others that went into communities, particularly after the riots to bring about a greater sense of cooperation with neighborhoods. I remember the uh, neighborhoods that where many people grew up in and didn't realize the fact that somehow or another, they tended to be segregated. You knew that there was segregation, but you found a way nonetheless to overcome it particularly in terms of where you live, that was very difficult. It was hard enough overcoming it in a segregated school system. So I don't wanna wallow in the past and say that the good old days were all good because they were not. Uh, but the good old days give us an example of how much better we can be if we're paying attention on a micro level to what happens in our city. What happens with our people, those who contribute, what happens with the faith community? Uh, of all different backgrounds and persuasions. What is their role? What's the role of community activists? What's the role of groups that just wanna give back? And so whether it's a group of men or a group of women or fraternities and sororities or just good old neighborhood associations, which has always been the backbone of our city, uh, those things I think we should pay attention to on a micro level as we go forward from today, because we are all looking for answers. We all want everything to work. We recognize that you get out of a hole the same way you got in, one shovel, one step, one effort at a time. And while we're all hoping uh, for a great uh, new future under the administration that's getting ready to take office, we have to be as citizens constantly vigilant in terms of raising issues, willing to work and do our share because an administration in and of itself is not gonna get it all done. And we've got to kind of look in the mirror every day and ask ourselves, do we like what we see? It's one thing to raise a window in a home and look out into the community and to see things and to say, I don't like this, I don't like this, and I don't like that. It's another thing to stand in front of a mirror at home and look at what we see because then we see all of our true warts and blemishes and our shortcomings. So we have to be honest enough, I think, in doing that looking to say we've got very serious shortcomings, but to believe that we have an inherent power to do better if we have an inherent will to believe we can do better. So well, it's a long answer to both of your questions, Rabbi, but on the larger level and on the smaller level, those are the things that I think we should be paying attention to once this call is over and we go into another day. I appreciate that. And I do want to make sure that we have time for uh, enough to cover a decent amount of ground. And I know your time is somewhat short tonight. Um, and we have a number of questions that have already come in from the chat. So I want to make sure we have time for those. Let me ask you, if you had to pick one legislative priority uh, that you're focused on that you feel has real bearing on our neighborhood on Central West Baltimore, what would that be? Hmm. Well, honestly, I believe it's this COVID relief package. I know that's not gonna build homes. It's not gonna put police on the street. Um, it's not gonna repair infrastructure. But unless we are able to win this battle so that the quality of life and life itself increases among the people in those neighborhoods, uh, everything else could very real, uh, really go to naught. I mean, it's good that there is a vaccine on the way, but in the interim, people are still dying. The most important thing for me right now in the Congress is what we're working on right now, and that is a relief package um, that will supplant and replace the first relief package that came in late March. 
and I'll tell you why. In just a couple of weeks by the end of this month, we are faced and will be as a nation, but particularly in Baltimore, with a tsunami of evictions. The eviction protection that was granted under the authorization back in the spring is about to expire. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of people who are paying rent now who will find themselves out in the street as a result of these evictions. Landlords were able to receive money and offsets from the previous uh, package and tenants were able to have some measure and modicum of relief, but it's getting ready to run out. There is no longer any uh, forbearance on mortgages that runs out at the end of the month also. And so many people who have been struggling to pay their mortgages, homeowners are gonna find themselves in a situation that the fair forbearance that was provided that protected them from not being able to pay their mortgage or to pay it on time will be gone. When you consider also the fact that uh, there are so many people who right now are living week to week, really day to day, as a result of having lost jobs uh, because of some businesses that will never open again, or had their hours cut back, or did not have a job to begin with, it's important, I think, where we are providing cash to provide cash to people uh, on a weekly basis that it won't be the $600 uh, payment that came before. It'll probably be half of that because the Senate is really fighting us on this, but people need that. Schools need to open in Baltimore City. Teachers don't wanna go into unsafe classrooms. In order to re replace ventilation systems and provide for PPEs and to make a situation safe for teachers and students, that's a part of this bill, it's gotta be passed. The testing, the treatment, the tracing aspect of this is important because most of us will not get this vaccine until well into February in all likelihood and many beyond that. And so we still have to test, we still have to trace, we still have to treat. And so I could go on and on and on about the things that are needed. I didn't mention small businesses, but I could and I perhaps I should because so many of them in Baltimore are closing up. Uh, it's bad enough that there were not enough, in my opinion, small businesses operating to create a circle of flow of capital. But the fact that so many are closing and some will never open their doors again without a proper infusion of government assistance, I think just cries out for our attention as it does uh, with humans and with individuals. So um, there are issues and measures after that that will be introduced in the upcoming Congress that starts on January 3rd. We don't know all that they, there will be. We do know that there will be a major housing package introduced uh, on the House side and hopefully a companion measure on the Senate side, that there will be additional monies for infrastructure and things of that nature. Uh, and I should say, by the way, this package that we're working on really provides money for state and local governments. So the city of Baltimore, uh, which is strapped in terms of its ability to pay for vital services like fire and police and water and all the other things that, that we take for granted would stand to benefit from the passage of this legislation. Uh, and then of course, once the money is in the coffers of state and local governments, doesn't mean that cures all their problems, but it helps them to get through another couple of months. We have to do that, I think. And um, of, course, of course, it's not to. brick and mortar, but I believe it's just as important. Well, and of course, we have to bring about the end of the pandemic itself, which is going to take people uh, really abiding by the advice of scientists and uh, and uh, healthcare professionals um, so that we can get this thing under control right now. So I hope folks are are uh, really making a point of staying home during the holiday season and not spreading the virus. Uh, that'll be important as well so we can get back to uh, other kinds of things. Let me ask you, Congressman, uh, a priority in the neighborhood here and in West Baltimore has been uh, expressing concern about the BNP tunnel project. Uh, we got a question about that in the chat. It was something I wanted to ask you about as well. Uh, are you familiar with that project? I, I am familiar with it. And I, I will say to you that uh, there has been little transparency around the project. Uh, the, the new pathway, which has been ostensibly about commuter rail uh, and an Amtrak track project, uh, arcs through uh, wet, 
you know, black West Baltimore and conveniently avoids uh, wider neighborhoods uh, near the Jones Falls Expressway. There's some concern that's been expressed in our neighborhood and in neighborhoods to our west and our south about this project uh, that we're talking about bringing hazardous materials, um, uh, double stack rail through populated areas. Uh, we're concerned about this and I'm, I'm wondering if we can uh, get you on record uh, your stance on the project and and if, if you have concerns and if you do, uh, are there things that you can be doing at the federal level to forestall uh, it, its inevitability? I'll tell you one other thing about it is there's a plan to build a vent tower, a multi-story vent tower um, that would be spewing out uh, diesel exhaust uh, into the air right across from the Dorothy I. Height uh, elementary school, brand new elementary school in our neighborhood. And there's concern about that in a neighborhood that uh, and in a city which already has higher incidence of asthma. So say a word about about this project and uh, maybe you can shine a light on what's really going on here beneath the surface. Well, I don't know that I can necessarily shine a light. I've been in office for five months and I'm getting on top of as many issues as I can. This one I'm quite familiar with. And as you may or may not know, I pride myself in being an environmentalist. And so the fact that all sorts of carcinogens uh, could perhaps be spewed into the air, the fact that this is going underground in communities that are the least uh, able to defend themselves in many instances, and considering the fact that there are a lot of federal subsidies involved here, uh, really cries out for some sort of statewide approach and I don't know, that, but I don't believe, and I, maybe I'm going too far by saying this, I don't know that the uh, Maryland congressional delegation has had this matter before them, although they could have before I got there, and I will try to find that out. But I think there's a role here for both the federal government, uh, the state government, and the city. I mean, it's gotta be a trifold approach in my opinion. Um, we could just kind of look at this and throw our hands up and say there's nothing we can do, and this can be like the project that went out Franklin Street, the road to nowhere. Or we can assume like we've done before that there was no sense worrying about what was happening underground in terms of CXX trains and other things like that until we have, as we've had in the past, accidents with hazardous materials. Or there is a way to be proactive and proactive in my opinion means garnering the resources and garnering the support of all three levels of government. I mean, there's a reason that I'm called a representative. I, I am supposed to represent as best I can the interests of as many people as I can. Uh, but the mayor is a representative and our senators are representative and members of the state legislature. And I strongly would urge the partners that are working with you, Rabbi Berg, to pull this together uh, to try to convene or at least, at least make sure everybody knows what's going on. And then we can do the convening. But I don't know to what extent, and I'm talking because I don't know, that the city has been involved in this in any sort of way that provides you and all of you with some level of comfort. Well, I would love to engage with you further. I'd be happy also to connect you up with the leadership of an organization called Residents Against the Tunnels, who I'm sure would be delighted to speak with you uh, and share their thoughts and concerns with you. So maybe we can do that offline at a, uh, as well. And, and I would go further. I think they ought to convene if they want to speak. Let's convene all of us, myself, the mayor's office, president of the city council, one of or two of our senators, another representative, because in my opinion, this is so urgent. You know, if you don't move fast on this, you won't be able to move that it ought to be everybody at once hearing the same thing at once. Because if you do that in eight or nine or 10 different meetings or just with me, you lose, I think, the ability to make the greatest impact. I think it's a great idea. And maybe you can help get some of those uh, folks at the table as well. Let me let me move to uh, a different topic, uh, uh, one that just came to my attention today. And then pretty soon I want to get to some questions from the chat. Um, this is a, 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 a bill that's currently in the House. It's called the Each Woman Act, uh, H.R. 1692, which would end the Hyde Amendment. Um, and uh, for those who are not aware, the Hyde Amendment uh, it, um, really uh, uh, prohibits uh, women from seeking rep reproductive health support, specifically abortions, um, if they are on Medicaid. Uh, this would end that. Uh, within the Jewish tradition, uh, we uh, we certainly have a concern about 
um, uh, uh, you know, women having the right to sort of choose what happens to their own bodies. I know uh, that uh, I believe you've been a supporter of, of uh, reproductive rights, um, but it did come to my attention that of the uh, six Maryland uh, congressional colleagues who are co-sponsoring the bill, one of which was the late Elijah Cummings, um, I believe you are not yet co-sponsoring that bill, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to, to do so. <laughs> Rabbi Bird, you sound like a reporter. Let's talk. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's not have that kind of Q&A. Uh, there are about 5,000 bills in the Congress right now. I have gone through as many as I could in the five months that I've been there, and I've been signing on as co-sponsors. But I stopped doing that a month ago when I realized everything that's there now will expire on January the 2nd when the new Congress kicks over on January the 3rd. What I've done in some instances was to take some pieces of legislation to ask unanimous consent that they be granted to me so that I might be able to move them through right away. One of those is the Henrietta Lacks Cancer Research Act, which I will have on the floor of the Congress on Thursday of this week, which was originally sponsored by Elijah. And one of the things I said going in is that I would look at many pieces of his legislation as I could out of my respect for him and to try to make sure they didn't die in this Congress. So we're doing that with three different pieces of his legislation. Other legislation like that, which I support, I'm not on it because after a certain time, you cannot get on legislation as the Congress expires because mm -hmm. there's no real thought that it's going to come to a vote. So if you will just let me get to January when the new Congress yeah. uh, takes over, uh, you will see that I'm, I'll be right there with my Maryland colleagues, all of whom had a year and a half jump on me uh, regarding sponsorship of this legislation. I understand. I appreciate that. And certainly uh, I, I have no interest in being a reporter. I was simply conveying uh, uh, from some good friends of mine at the Nas Not National Conference of Jewish Women who said they've been trying to get in touch with your office. I'm glad to hear you support the legislation. I think it's important legislation. Well, um, I've always supported that type of legislation. I've got 10 years on the record as a member of Congress like that with a very high rating from most groups that st score that. And in addition to that, my work with the NAACP was in the forefront for nine years on those issues. So if somebody didn't reach me, they shouldn't worry too much. There's a lot going on. And when all settles, all, everything settles, I'll be right where I've always been. What I think is on the right side of things. I'm sure they'll be glad to hear that. Let me go to some questions from the chat here. A number of people have questions for you. Uh, let me see if I can combine a couple. Uh, and this is gonna be about uh, police reform, police accountability. Uh, obviously we're under a consent decree. Um, the extent to which these things uh, are dealt with at the federal level is, you know, so I, I want to sort of invite you not to obviously have to, you know, make decisions for what happens in Annapolis or what happens in, in Baltimore City, but obviously your, your, your uh, imprimatur and, and your, uh, your passion for this issue uh, ought to have some bearing on this matter. So we have a question here about the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. That's a question from uh, Mona Lisa Diallo and also uh, a question here from uh, my friend and neighbor, Ray Kelly, who is asking, uh, do you support local control of the Baltimore Police Department uh, as well? As you know, it is a, a state agency. It's been that way since about the uh, end of the Civil War. Doesn't make a lot of sense, I think. But do you have any thoughts about either those specific questions or broadly about police accountability and police reform? What do you think ought to be done that's not already being done uh, to uh, increase safety for uh, African-Americans here in, in Baltimore and uh, uh, to improve the practices of the Baltimore Police Department away from some of uh, the real problems they've had over the years? Well, first, I think that the control of the police department ought to be uh, overseen by the entity or the government that oversees the area that's being patrolled, which is Baltimore City. I've never understood why the mayor of the city didn't have that power. And that can change, but that can't change through the Congress. That has to change in Annapolis. And I would hope that there are enough, or certainly many, uh, members of the House of Delegates and the State Senate that feel that way. But, you know, the city has to make the request. Uh, the mayor has to make the request and the city delegation would have to support it. 
but I definitely support it. I'm not trying to tell them what to do. I'm simply saying that's how you change it. If it, if you really want to get that change, it makes absolutely no sense to me. It's like the president of the United States controlling the National Guard totally in Maryland without any input from the governor. On the other side of the question, what I would say is that the best thing to do now in terms of uh, police accountability, police reporting, police oversight, and police reform is to follow the dictates of the consent decree issued by the feds. Uh, that decree has been in place. Usually where those things are in place, there is a way to verify and measure progress and there's accountability. Uh, and I think that more than anything else, that's what we've got to focus on. And we've got to be supportive of the police commissioner who's working hard to uh, live up to the tenets of that consent decree. And we've got to support the mayor and others who believe in it. I appreciate that. Let me go to uh, the chat some more here. Uh, we have a question. Let's see, I already had. Um... By the way, Rabbi Berg, I can't see anybody. So how many people do we have here tonight? I don't know. I'm not watching the YouTube either. I'm just looking at you, sir. Ah, uh, okay. I, I so I'm not sure. You. I've got I've got a wonderful uh, um, program coordinator uh, named Jamie who is sending me uh, questions as she takes them from the YouTube chat. So we okay. are patching our Zoom feed into there. Uh, uh, hopefully, a number of people are watching, and they'll obviously also have the opportunity to watch after the fact as well. Um, right. So I appreciate that. That's um, great. We so let's see. Here's a question. Uh, from another, oh, this actually also comes from Ray Kelly. So beyond the pandemic, uh, how do you, uh, I don't know if you know Ray, Ray's the uh, former director of the No Boundaries Coalition and the Citizens Policing Project. He's a great guy and recently moved back to the neighborhood. Uh, beyond the pandemic, how do we prioritize everything uh, uh, urgent in many neighborhoods? How, um, how do we finally overcome imposed poverty on entire uh, communities. And maybe I'll just sort of build on Ray's question, which is also um, the, 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 you know, the balance between sort of investing in communities of color. And I will also say about our own neighborhood here in Reservoir Hill, uh, that you were speaking, Congressman, about, uh, you know, a little bit waxing poetic about, about, about history and, and officer friendly. I know I've heard Ray talk about officer friendly over the years and about neighborhoods that used to be more diverse and frankly, more neighborly. Uh, Reservoir Hill is a, a wonderful and neighborly community. Uh, one concern in this neighborhood is gentrification. So whereas uh, you go back you know, half a century and there was real concern uh, about, about white flight uh, and divestment from communities of color um, and older congregants of mine who will talk about having grown up in diverse communities. And if you drill down a little bit, you realize that they were actually transitional communities uh, and not really sustainably diverse communities. Now we're seeing sort of the reverse trends uh, in a lot of the city and to a certain extent here in Reservoir Hill. So what are your thoughts about that, about sort of how to preserve um, sustainable diversity uh, and to avoid displacement of black and brown people in a neighborhood like ours? Well, one thing you have to do is to prevent blockbusting and people who are coming in to look to flip homes or have no idea, no desire to live in communities, but to pretty much rape and pillage communities literally by controlling the real estate in those communities. Uh, that's one thing. And there are a lot of people that, that fall into that bucket. And um, to the extent that we can, I think we've got to talk about that. Um, beyond that, it's a very, very complex problem and a very complex question. So I don't know that I have a simple answer, except that we have got to find a way to be supportive of community organizations. One of the things that made Baltimore strong through the 50s and 60s and 70s and even the 80s was our fabric of community associations. They were the bond and, and, and the, the quilt that sort of held everything together, no matter how things were going and no matter how bad it may have seemed. I don't know that community organizations are getting the same kind of support like they once did. And that's without casting aspersions or pointing a finger, it's raising a question, are they? And if they are not, we need to hear from them more. Everybody needs to hear from them more because we don't have strong community associations. Uh, gentrification is going to take place. And if we have community associations that are a part of the gentrification, 
uh, then we have a very serious problem in, in my opinion. Um, but I, I'm, I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna make light of this. It is a very, very, very complex issue because if it were simple, we would have figured this out by now. But the gentrification that we see taking place uh, is, I don't wanna say mirroring, but it has mirrored what has happened in Washington, DC, which started in Georgetown years ago and has run all the way up the Gold Coast in Washington and other places. Uh, there's gotta be strong local leadership and a strong local desire to make sure that communities remain stable. And I don't wanna get in front of the city council or the mayor, except to say that I think what you will find is that communities are hoping and crying out for that kind of support so that they have enough power to do what they can do on the ground to prevent those sort of things from happening. But it is a very, very complex issue. Let me ask you, and I appreciate that. I agree it's complex. It's something I've been struggling with a lot myself. Uh, let me ask you, Congressman, um, about uh, for those who were not here maybe at, in your first decade of service in the U.S. Rep House of Representatives, um, uh, tell us a little bit about your communication strategy. For those of us who want to um, you know, be able to turn to our congressman and, and bring concerns to you. What's the best way for people to, to do that, uh, to provide input and feedback and for you to, to communicate with your constituents here in the seventh? Well, I communicate on all three major social media platforms regularly, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we have a robust site, uh, congressional site that's up and running that allows people to directly communicate with me on a number of issues. Uh, and we've got caseworkers throughout the district who are at our offices in Baltimore, Ellicott City and Baltimore County, working on consumed constituent cases every day. Uh, in addition to that, we're starting a series of town halls that will be taking place. And we're doing regular outreach through communications, newsletters, email, and that sort of thing. So my strategy today, uh, and I don't even want to use the word strategy, my approach today is far different than it was when I served because times have changed. Back then it was basically snail mail uh, and at some point the internet, uh, but things are different now. People communicate differently. We found a way to reach those platforms to be successful, uh, both on the campaign side, which is all over, but more importantly, in, in a more robust manner now on the congressional side. So I would urge people uh, to go to that website or urge people to reach us on any of those three platforms, be a part of our town meetings, write us, mail us, call us. Everything you do with any other member of Congress, you ought to do it with me. Nothing's different. Understood. Let me ask you about the, the Jewish community specifically. I, I'm here in a synagogue. Uh, I don't know. I think you've probably been to, to Beth Am before. I actually ran into Lanny Lebo Sachs today. Uh, she sends her, her regards uh, and she's been a longtime member of, of this congregation. I'm sure you know a number of our members. Um, we've had in the past several years a significant rise in express anti-Semitism nationally, uh, violent anti-Semitism as well. There are, we're so polarized right now as a nation. Uh, could you give us some thoughts about how to build br bridges, um, both in terms of sort of addressing the particular scourge of anti-Semitism, but also uh, about kind of thinking about um, uh, softening boundaries, as I said earlier, between different religions, different peoples, different, different races as well, uh, getting past some of the polarization, othering, uh, and weaponizing of, of disinformation that we're seeing that's affected uh, my community, whether it's white Jews or black Jews or brown Jews, uh, or obviously African-Americans broadly in the country right now. I think the simple approaches still work today as they worked years ago. Um, the first thing is that people have to reach out toward one another. If they don't, they'll never hear one another. Second thing is that in reaching out, you got to build a bond of trust so that your word becomes your word and that you in the process are able not only to express the things that concern you, but to listen to the things that concern other people who may not be like you. If we're doing that on both sides, we have really made some progress there. Um, and then beyond that is to figure out what are those areas of mutual benefit where both 
parties in this case, or both races or both religions can find a common ground. I belonged to something years ago called the Blues. It was a group of us, we were black and Jewish. That's the name we came up with and we operated under the same principles. We wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to one another. We were making sure that we were hearing one another and we were making sure that we charted out a course of mutual concerns that we could both be victorious and successful at. Uh, those things are very, very important. Um, I don't know how many people who are listening may hear me speak, but usually all my speeches begin with the same thing. And that is racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism are wrong. Black bigotry is just as cruel and evil as white bigotry or green bigotry or any other color, that there are too many bigots in too many places. That gay bashing, immigrant bashing, and union bashing deplete us as a nation and rob us of our ability to make true and lasting change. Those are the things I believe in, and those are the things that I always say when I go to speak, because I don't want people to guess about where I am on things. But more importantly, I want people who feel the same way to know that they are not alone. Uh, so much what we do today depends on what happens the next day and the day after that. Elijah Cummings used to say particularly that most of our responsibility is not just to ourselves as adults, but also to our children, because they are the messages that we send to a future that we will never see. And so his efforts through the Elijah Cummings Youth Leadership Program affecting black kids and Jewish kids is significant. It builds on the fact that Ben Cardin and I started a program like that many years ago called Operation Understanding with the clear goal of reaching out, listening and figuring out with young people, what are the things that they see and saw uh, that they believe we can find common ground on. Um, I just think that people will judge us by what we say and not what we do. And when it comes to finding a way to increase understanding among communities, uh, to increase trust, to lower suspicion, and to be willing enough to listen and to reach out, that's how we make differences. I appreciate your saying that very much. Do you have time for maybe just a couple more questions, sir? Sure. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to do uh, one more on healthcare that came through the chat and uh, it's the following 100,000 African Americans live in food insecure districts, many located in the seventh, the number one killer in Baltimore of African Americans writes uh, Mona Lisa Diallo is, uh, is heart disease. How do you plan to address this inequity? Well, heart disease is the number one killer in America. It's not just the number one killer in the black community, except two days ago, COVID became the number one killer uh, in this country. So I think that when we talk about the inequities that exist, because it's more than that, it's we have to break cancer down. It's prostate cancer in black men, six times the national average, breast cancer in black women, four or five times the national average, other cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, hypertension, HIV, diabetes, stroke. It's a long list of things that create morbidities and comorbidities that drive down life expectancy in our communities. One of the things that I've tried to do uh, before ever getting back into the Congress was to fight in the private sector for that. I served as the president of the National Medical Association, which is the largest organization representing African-Americans doctors and dentists across this country um, and did that because for me, finding a way to drive down these disparities uh, was absolutely paramount. And I use that bully pulpit to do that with a number of African-American physicians who also wanted to do that. I spent four or five years at the National Institutes of Health uh, on the advisory council of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Again, ringing the alarm bell creating projects in communities across this nation and providing information, but more importantly, trying to reach people where they are to get them to take better care of their health and to control uh, their lives in that regard. And I just concluded uh, last year, a five-year research project, project, excuse me, here in Maryland, uh, dealing with disparities, disparities in healthcare uh, among racial groups and among other marginalized groups um, so 
I've worked at that. I understand it. I mean, I, I really, really understand it. And for me, it started many years ago in the city council when I chaired the health committee and tried to find a way in those days just to get people to pay attention to something that was growing among us called AIDS, which no one thought was a threat at that time. I think that we've got to find a way to get information to people and not to berate anybody because they may not be taking care of their, their health, but to help them find a way to control it. That's one thing. The government side of this is that government has to provide adequate health care for persons who are trying to take full control of their lives and health care in such a way that it is both affordable and accessible. And until there's universal health care, we've got to make sure that affordability and accessibility are in place. And the government has a role also, in my opinion, to drive down prescription costs, which are out of hand because we don't negotiate as a government on the no open market for prescription drugs. We buy at the sale price, which no other country is doing but us. It mm -hmm. absolutely makes no sense. And so our prescription costs are out of hand. Our affordability and our accessibility are still something we have yet to get to. Our information to people in an educative sort of way to make sure that they know what they can do until help arrives by taking care of themselves better uh, are all things that are important to me. And those things I think help get to the crust, I hope, of the question that was just asked. It's a big, heavy, heavy duty task. But if we don't have our health, we don't have anything. One of the things that I made a point of in the years that I was at the NAACP is to remind people that health is a civil rights issue. Don't let anybody tell you anything other than that. It really is, and it deserves the protection uh, that we provide for other rights that we want to guarantee and to keep. You know, it's been a hundred years since the last global pandemic like this one. I, uh, uh, there's a there's a Hebrew word halavai, which means something like it should be the case, right? Um, wouldn't it be great, uh, halavai, that you know, a hundred years from now, God forbid, if we encounter another global pandemic like COVID-19, that we wouldn't see the kind of disparities that we continue to see now. It was so predictable to say that, of course, communities of color are going to be more greatly affected by, uh, by COVID than than white folks, and and it wouldn't be great if if that's never the case that we rise and fall together as one community. Um, I have one final question for you before we wrap up, sir. Uh, and that is about transportation. As you know, um, we already spoke about the BMP tunnel, but uh, in Baltimore, people are still pretty bitter about the red line and uh, Governor Hogan's scuttling of that project, tens of millions of federal dollars left on the table or redirected to, to Washington for for the Purple Line and for other kinds of infrastructure. Uh, what can and should be done to make Baltimore a more walkable, bikeable, livable city um, with your stewardship uh, and that of the Maryland delegation in Washington, what sort of federal investment might we see in public transportation, Baltimore infrastructure in the coming years? Well, let me just remind you that the Purple Line, which seemed to get all the attention years ago, is fraught with problems. $150 million in cost overruns that the state has just agreed, as I've read, to, to go ahead and to eat and to pay. Um, so it was looking rosy and purple, but it was not that purple or rosy as we now see. Um, beyond that, how we make Baltimore more walkable and rideable and, and those sort of things starts with how do we make it safer? No one is going to do anything in this city that puts their life and their safety in jeopardy. So for me, everything goes back to safety curbing the violence, getting our city under control. I think the things that we've seen with bike lanes through the city council and novel ways to commute through a circulator system downtown or car rides and car shares are all good. And uh, the fact that we are making better use of open space so that people can walk and be safe and walk and feel secure, even if they have to walk in groups it's not gonna ever reach its fullest potential until we deal with the issue of safety and violence in our city. And we find a way to give people a sense, not only of neighborhood and community, but of safety. You know, people are worried about their wives, they're worried about their husbands, they're worried about their children, who all they have to do after great life is to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We've got to find a way to do that. And, you know, I don't wanna 
try to tell the mayor what to do, nor will I. But for me, the number one issue in our city that we all love is to find a way to make it safer again, less violent and cleaner again, and more vibrant with real community associations that care for one another and get cared for by our city. Well said, Congressman, thank you. I wanna uh, thank you for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. I know you're squeezing uh, this in between the omnibus bill and some family uh, time as well. Um, folks who are tuning in, I hope that you will be with us as we continue our newly elected series. Next, we'll be joined by incoming city councilman, James Torrance, that's January 7th, followed by the new uh, city council president, Nick Mosby, tentatively uh, January 28th, that we're still finalizing that date. Um, last month, Congressman, I shared with Mayor Lex Scott an 1,800-year-old Jewish teaching in the name of Rabbi Hanina, who said, pray for the welfare of the government, for were it not for the fear it inspires, each person would swallow their neighbor alive. Uh, the word yira in Hebrew, uh, fear, also means awe. And I want to close this evening by posing a question for all of us to consider. What would it be like if citizens and other residents of this country had real reverence for those who represent them? What would it look like if the Congress were actually deserving of that reverence on the whole? Uh, if we made real progress dismantling systemic racism, eclipsing the voices of misogyny and nativism and jingoism um, that exist, wouldn't that be a different kind of America to look forward to? I'll certainly be praying for that. We look forward to working with you, Congressman, toward a better and more just Baltimore. And I thank you again for your time this evening. Well, Rabbi, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of the many people who are on this uh, call that I can't see. Thank you for taking time in your evening to be here. Um, as you can see, I don't have every answer for every question. Uh, and I'm not, a, by any means, a perfect person. This is not a perfect nation, but I believe God calls all of us to a perfect mission, and that is to do everything that we can do in the time that we have on this earth uh, to make it the sort of place that we would want to bequeath to our sons and to our daughters. And so on that note, thank you all. I, before ending and saying good night, uh, please keep, if you will, the Sarbanes family in your thoughts and in your prayers. Paul was a dear friend a great leader for our state and somebody who gave everything he had to his job. Thank you very, very much. Amen. Amen. Good night. Good Thank night. you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you.